Hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. This week you're going to be seeing something a little different, and we're just going to be doing the slides with this video. That said, it is still the same teaching from this weekend, and we really believe that this one will challenge you spiritually. So that said, let's get into the series finale of Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. Lord declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God. Be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. I am King Amon. You could say, I am like my father Manasseh. Then, he turned weak. But I will always live by the sword. I am Josiah. I mean, I am King Josiah. I want my nation to be healed. I will love the Lord my God. The kingdom of Judah will serve the Lord. Our God reigns forever. I gotta grab this real quick and then we'll get going. Well, we're in our final week 
Um, Ammon and Josiah are our two kings today. And when we look at this, what we have to do is understand that we have kind of a paradox of kings in this. You have not a paradox, a, a parallel course where you see one king is is holding to the, the the ethic of grasping power and doing harm, and that's King Ammon, and he dies fairly quickly. But Josiah takes the throne at eight years old, and when we look at the life of young Josiah, we have to understand that. Um, this, this story we've been in, this lineage of the kings, the sons of David who've ruled on the throne of Judah in Jerusalem for these many generations, these men have been quite often apostate and evil. And you even look at Manasseh last week who was so wicked and so bad, but he lives into the theme of this book of Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings. And the theme is really this, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. Will you finish well? Will your heart stay tuned towards the Lord? Will you do what's right in his, his eyes? And this, these books, this series has pointed us to the reality and the high calling we face to be faithful to God presently and not live off past success not live off um, the salvation we received and think that was our only experience with God, but live faithfully with him day in, day out, attending to his word in prayer, in service and life together. Will we be faithful to Christ is the challenge we come out of this series with. How will we finish? So today as we turn our hearts towards this, I think one of the realities is we have to look at, um, at this story in well, let's look at it this way. There's a story of a guy in Alaska who owned um, an eagle. I think it was a golden eagle. I'm, I'm not sure the, the type. But he liked it so much, he chained it by its little bird foot. And um, it, he tied it to a post. And the eagle couldn't fly, so it walked circles around that post for years. It actually had a rut that it had carved into the ground. Eventually, the guy looks out and he says, you know what, this eagle's too wonderful. I'm going to just let it free. So he takes off the, the shackle on the little bird foot and he throws it in the air and it just whomp, comes back to the ground. He turns, it turns around, walks over, gets in its rut and starts circling. It was completely set free. It was completely free from what had held it in that place. But it had learned a life of slavery. It had learned a life that said, this is what you do. This and nothing else. I'm going to stay on this same circuit. Apparently this is life. It was held by what enslaved it for so many years. And the reality is for you and I is that we have to understand Christianity and many Christians live in this weird circle where we do what we think is right and we never actually do the thing we were made to do. We never fill the sky, right? We never get up and really take flight in the calling God's given us. We stay on this, this weird track and do the thing that was never intended for us. And it's time for you and I to start living in the power of our redemption. To start living in the power of our redemption, in the power of Christ, in the power of a God who loves us because there's not anything more sad than seeing something that's absolutely free and independent behaving as though it is enslaved. And many of us are enslaved to religious routines, to addictions and behaviors that are breaking us. And we have to understand that we are called to live in the power of our redemption, to live in the power of Christ and to understand that for you and I, we are creatures who will go back to a very unhealthy rut and habit that has no life in it. Here's, here's where it really comes down to. You may define yourself like that eagle did as something that's bound to this one thing. But I, I want to encourage you out of this story. You are not too young. Look at King Josiah. He was eight years old when he took the throne. Listen to the words of Paul to Timothy. Don't let anyone judge you because you are young. You're never too young to live faithfully into the calling of God. You are not destined to be like your parents. Look at King Hezekiah. The promise of his life is that he wasn't like his father, Ahaz. 
You're not destined to repeat those mistakes. You're not too sinful or too broken and hurt to be faithful to God and have him use your life in powerful ways. Look at the life of King Manasseh. When we look at this story, we have to grab onto one central truth that echoes throughout the whole of Scripture. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament was coming to set you free, and in the New Testament we grab onto that promise and we hold firm that Jesus Christ has set us free to live a life that not only glorifies him, but is what we were intended and purposed to be. God made us to be his witnesses. So what I'd like to do today is join, kind of uh, take a walk through Scripture with you. We'll start in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and we'll, and, and we'll look at that for a minute, and then we'll read some out of 35. In 2 Chronicles 34, King Amon dies by the sword. King Josiah comes to the throne at eight years old. At eight years old, I still needed help with everything, much less running a kingdom. I mean, that's kind of terrifying in, in the thought. But really, it's amazing because if you look at 2 Chronicles chapter, um, chapter 34, verses 14, you fo- or verse 8 through 14, you see King Josiah is having them clean up the temple, clean up the temple mount, get all the dirt and horrible things out of it. The dirt, when I say that, I mean the, the idols and the, the Asherah poles and things. Get those things out of there and make it a faithful place of worship. And in that time, they come across the book of the law, the law of Moses. They come across the book of the law. They read the book of the law, and then they tear their robes and bring it to the king, and they say, King, look what we found. This is the commandments. This is the Torah. This is the law of God that was given us through Moses, the great prophet. And Josiah tears his robes and laments and grabs onto the scriptures because he sees that they've been unfaithful. But it was like he had found a treasure because not only was he young, he was about eight years into his reign at this point. So he's 16 years old. But he sees the heart of God in the law and he calls the people back to God. He calls the people back to God and he calls them to be faithful. He goes on a treasure hunt. Anybody here ever take your kids or something or or your grandkids or nieces and nephews and you go to a park and you have like a treasure hunt? Anybody ever do that? And they like come back with a bone and you're like, oh gosh, what if that's a, you know, you're like, please be a dog, throw it in the weeds and you all go home. You know, but sometimes every once in a while, kids come up and like, I found an acorn and it's like half eaten or a leaf or a stick. One time our son Ethan was on a treasure hunt, I think with a class. He comes up and they're like, you know, stick, acorn. Ethan's like, ring, and I think there's diamonds, and we're like, ooh, you know, like, and he did, he found a ring, and we're like, oh, this is awesome, and I don't think it was super valuable, we didn't put a sign out, um, because Ethan's like, no, this is mine, and it's still in his bedroom to this day, he's like, no, I found a treasure, it's super mine, and we're like, you kind of did, that's awesome, nobody ever does that without a metal detector, but he's like, I looked down, I saw it, I found it, and I grabbed it, and he held on to it, he found a treasure worth, worth holding, and he wouldn't let it go. Josiah did the same thing when it came to the book of the law. When he found the law, it was a treasure worth holding on to. It was God telling his people how to live in faithful relationship. So let's join the story of Josiah. 2 Chronicles 35, 8 to 19 says this. And by the way, there's more of these names that just torture my dyslexic tongue. So let's just enjoy that. Um, Okay, his, Josiah's uh, officials also contributed voluntarily to the people and the priests and the Levites, Hilkiah, Zechariah, Jehiel, the officials in charge of God's temple, gave the priests 2,600 Passover offerings and 300 cattle. Also, uh, that guy, along with Shimeiah and Nathaniel and his brothers and uh, um, and Jehiel and Josabad, I can't do it. There's too many A's in there. Um, The leaders of the Levites provided 5,000 Passover offerings, 500 head of cattle for the Levites. The service was arranged. The priests stood in their places with the Levites in their divisions as the king had ordered. The Passover lambs were slaughtered. The priests splashed against the altar the blood handed to them while the Levites skinned the animals. 
They set aside the burnt offerings to give them to the subdivisions of the families of the people to offer to the Lord, as it is written in the book of the Moses, the book of the law that they had found. They did the same with the cattle. They roasted the Passover animals over the fire as prescribed and boiled the holy offerings in pots, cauldrons, and pans. Anybody here ever let your kids cook a meal one night and they use every utensil God ever created for cooking? And you're like, you look at the kitchen and you're like, did like a baboon get loose in here? Like what happened? Like, well, we cooked, right? I feel like that's what this is. They used every utensil. The pots, the cauldrons, and the pans, they brought it all out to try to cook all of these these offerings and serve them quickly to all of the people. After this, they made preparations for themselves and for the priests because the priests, the descendants of Aaron, were sacrificing the burnt offerings and the fat portions until nightfall. So the Levites made preparations for themselves and for the Aaronic priests. The musicians, the descendants of Asaph, were in their places, prescribed by David. Asaph, He-Man, who's in the Bible, and um, Jehudathun. Oh, I got that one. All right, uh, the king's seer. The gatekeepers at each gate did not leave their posts because their fellow Levites made the preparations for them. So at that time, the entire service of the Lord was carried out for the celebration of the Passover and the offering of of burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord. As King Josiah had ordered, the Israelites who were present celebrated the Passover at that time and observed the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. The Passover had not been observed like this in Israel since the days of the prophet Samuel, and none of the kings of Israel had ever celebrated such a Passover as did Josiah with the priests, the Levites, and all Judah and Israel who were there with the people of Jerusalem. The Passover, this Passover was celebrated in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. This is a great story. This is one of those stories where you look at it and you just think, man, look at the response. The 18th year. He's been planning this party for about 10 years when they finally have it. They start pouring over the book of the law, and they put together a Passover that it was so big, it's never been celebrated in such a grand scale before or after. It was a beautiful thing. Now they had the treasure, right? They found the treasure. Once Josiah found the treasure, he was compelled to share it. And I want to point out to you, and I think this is fascinating, that we are ending this series, and we are literally, we're going into next, what's next, um, For this church, I think it's interesting how this all kind of comes together, how God kind of aligned it. It wasn't intentional on our part, but it really did come together when we were writing this and we could see that God is calling us into something next. But look at the way this kind of points towards the people of God and their role. Look at the great effort, the personal donations. Point, look at how all the people just served. They got invested and got involved for one reason, so everyone in Judah could participate, but it's not just Judah. If you look at verse 18 on that last slide, it says the people of Judah and Israel. Remember, Israel was the northern ten tribes, but they came down for the pilgrim feast of Passover. Passover. And they were serving the northern ten tribes as well. Those who came down for the Passover meals, they served them as well. They did it so that everyone had an opportunity to worship. They did it so everyone had a place at the table God had prepared. And I think that's an important ethic that we live into. I think it's important that we understand the calling to make sure that there is a place and an opportunity for everyone to worship and encounter the living God is something we hold dear to ourselves, that we make room whenever possible or whenever necessary so that people have a spot at the table God prepared for them. Look at what the guards did. The guards didn't leave their post The guards didn't leave their post. This is the very first, like, um, Uber Eats that was ever recorded in Scripture. They took the food to them where they were at. They brought out the meal to them so they could stand and faithfully do their duties. They brought them what they needed. The next thing we see is the priests burned the sacrifices till sundown. So get this. They slaughtered, 
and I think it was 800 head of cattle. They slaughtered, if you've ever, if you're like a deer hunter and you get a deer and you know what it's like to have to field dress a deer, it's a little rough. I'm a gagger. It's okay. I know you're like, you ate Burger King tacos, but still, that one gets me. Um, it's rough. But, but they, they gutted, they slaughtered, they gutted and they skinned 800 animals. They offered the appointed sacrifices with the different portions of the animals. They did this from sunrise till sunset. They worked the long day. They did everything they could so that everyone could be involved in faithful worship of God. They served in such a way that everyone could have their sacrifice rendered. And I think that's an important reality for the church. I think it's an important reality for us. Because in our situation, we can get very comfortable. But this calls us and shows us what it's like. This calls us to a treasure mentality. To think of this gospel as a treasure, as something we value and prize over everything else. And if your life is like anything, like Erica and I's, we just looked at each other and went, see you at Christmas when we did the family, when she did the family calendar. You're like, how are we going to do all this? How are we going to keep up with everything? And it shouldn't just be that. It should be a gospel-centered life. It should be a life that is called to treating the gospel as a treasure, not a mundane thing we do every week on a weird, rutted rotation, but something we live into. So now, you hold the treasure. You know this Jesus Christ. You've discovered the book of the law. You've discovered the gift of Jesus Christ, his salvation and the new life he offers in himself. You've been set free. Are you gonna stay in the rut and walk around like that broken-hearted eagle that didn't know it was still able to take to the skies? We can't live thinking that's okay. We have to understand That we're called to do something with this treasure. We're called to hold it, but also to serve it out. What are you going to do with the treasure? How are you going to finish your stories? It starts presently. We're all writing our epitaph, what they'll put on our gravestones right now. What's yours going to say? What's the story of your life going to be? What are you going to do with the treasure? Aren't you compelled like the priest's? The Levites and the people who are called to their stations, aren't you under the same calling to provide a place for people to be in worship? I would say yes and amen, you are. You have to, because you should feel the same compelling burn that I feel that everybody around us must hear the gospel. Everybody must hear of Jesus Christ. I think the hardest thing that was going on on our mission trip in Africa was how many people don't know Jesus because they're too far off the beaten path. And I think of the words of David Livingston. Don't give me the people who don't want to go on rough roads. Give me the people who don't need a road. And I'm like, ooh, that's so awesome. I mean, I want a road, right? All of a sudden, it's cool for someone else to quote it until I'm on an untracked path. But what if God calls you to the obedience? What if, well, God has called you to the obedience. What are you going to do with this treasure? What are you going to do with this treasure? And know this. This isn't like normal treasure. So let's do a math problem in public with me because that's fun. I have five pounds of gold. I give two pounds to Jack. Right? And Jack's like, yeah, I got two pounds of gold. How many pounds of gold do I have left? Three. Thank you. That was awesome. Well done. All right. So you got three. I've got three pounds of gold left, and that's our treasure principle in our heads. But in the kingdom of God, there is always enough to share. There is always enough of Jesus Christ to share like you're an open faucet. And if I share all I have of Jesus with Jack, I am no worse for the wear. I don't lose anything. In fact, I gain everything. My purpose is fulfilled. I don't have less because I share my time, my treasure, and my talent. I have my life that is a living witness to Jesus Christ. That's not bore into the ground as a rut, but it's a living witness to him. There will always be enough to share. The question is, will we be willing Are you willing to share the treasure you've been given? Or are you going to find a comfortable seat and say, actually, I just kind of attend here? That's not Christian life. So let me ask you a question. 
What is God telling you to do? What is he saying right now in your life? What is God calling you to do? Because he is speaking. The book of the law was always in the temple. It was just that it slowly got buried under a pile of treasures, other things that the world thought was valuable. And when they found it, they realized the depth of truth in it, what it called them to do, and they responded wholeheartedly. How will you respond to the calling of God? If you know Jesus Christ in this room, he's calling you to something. And he's not sorry for it, and neither am I. We, the church, have to live into it. Maybe you're called to teach a class in a church with this many people in it. There should never be a day where we say, hey, we're short a couple teachers, ever. We should be saying, sorry, we don't have room for you. That's brutal, but it's true, right? Sorry, we don't have room for you as a teacher right now, but we're opening a new venue. Would you be a part of that? Would you teach there? Would you help there? We should be pushing people back. We should never be up here going, come on, can you help? This either is everything to us or it's nothing. This is our treasure. Is he telling you, maybe you should work or serve in nursery? Which, seriously, how much better could life be? They're toothless little people who smile at you for no reason. They're wonderful. Sometimes they shame themselves in their little diapers, but they get changed. It's fine. They're wonderful. How could you not serve knowing that a mom and dad might desperately need a few minutes of quiet? And just need to hear about God and hear a calling on their life. A lot of us remember the grind of having little kids serve so that other people can be nourished and grow. Maybe he's calling you to teach that class. Maybe he's calling you to work in nursery. Maybe he's calling you to go to a different venue and be part of a servant leadership team that gets a new place opened up so everyone can have a seat at the table. I will tell you this, a lot of people are scared of rooms this size. So we have Rooster going down the road. We have West going. We have Sea of Monday. We're launching a new service this coming fall. We'll talk about that another time. But it's going to be awesome. We need people who feel the calling and the urge to bring the treasure to their friends, to their coworkers, to their neighbors. So, so maybe we make room so you can bring friends. Because here's the problem. It's the middle of August, and I only see some seats right over there and a couple up front. So we have to make room for everybody to have a seat at the table. You have to get out of your comfortable rut and start doing what is faithful. Maybe he's telling you to give towards the next building. I would encourage you. If God calls you to be generous, God will provide for that generosity. Don't deny the calling for us in costly ways. Remember how long the the Levites served. They stayed at their post. They gave generously of themselves. They did everything they could to do what was next in their day and age. Each one of us lives under the same calling. What are you going to do next? What is God calling you to? You're not on a spiritual plateau of nirvana where you're like, I really feel like I've arrived. No one's arrived. And if you have, you're soon to leave this earth. It's kind of depressing, but it's true, right? I've never, I mean, not, nobody in my ministry experience has God been like, wow, they're really good. <gasps> and like, oh they, oh, they were raptured. No, that hasn't happened yet. We're obeying into what's next. May our next step be one of obedience. What is God calling you to do next? Here's what I'd like to challenge. Kids, kids, I would love for you to respond and lead us as a church in this. When you're younger, people are like, hey, that's a great idea. But you know, every, like Matt said in his teaching last week about their games, youth group games are a disaster. It's why church insurance is so expensive. And they're awesome, and they should never end. They should never stop. Why? Because kids know how to engage faith. Your children most likely woke up and said, what's for breakfast? Not, is there breakfast? They woke up and they wanted to know what's to eat. They want to know what's for dinner, but they don't wonder if you're going to give it to them. They don't want to, Mom, where's my clean shirts? They, they call out for you because they expect it. Why? Because they're kids. They know how to look up. They know how to depend freely. 
Kids, lead the way. Remind us of what Jesus said in Matthew 18, 2, when he said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to become like one of these. And he pulled a little child in. Why? Because children aren't worried so much about their value as much as they are obedience and pleasing their parents. How great if our church was dedicated to obeying in courageous ways the calling of God and pleasing him in everything we do. Kids, you've got to respond. You may be like, I'm sorry, I'm only eight years old. Well, Josiah was king. I think you can do it. I think you can do it. You can pull it off. You can set the pace for us grumpy, stodgy, rutted adults and show us the way into faithful living because you're better at it than we are. Kids, lead the way. Set the pace. I would love to see our children rise up and tell us what's next because of their friends who are in need or their friends who don't know Jesus. I love the idea of our children leading. So let me challenge you. We as a church are leaning into what is next. What is God doing next in this community and the world beyond? We are not gonna put a stop sign out that we construct. If God halts us, we'll halt. But until he does, we will faithfully, courageously, and if necessarily, blindly obey him. Because every time the church did that, it grew. Not just in numbers, but it grew in depth. It grew in relationship. It grew in dependence on God and one another. So if you're wondering, okay, God, what are you calling me to here? And you're wrestling with something that seems bigger than you. Do you think God won't help you do what he called you to do? I, God will help you be who he called you to be. He made you. He will put you in the right place if you'll obey him, and he'll provide for you as you obey, not before. You have to live into the obedience. He will provide into what he calls you into. You must first obey. So don't sit and doubt God. Don't sit and doubt your own resolve. Act in obedience, courageous obedience, for three reasons. He is God. You have audience with Almighty God at any moment of your day. Act in obedience because he is God. Act in obedience because he is faithful. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and me. He is God. He is faithful. And he is calling. Church, hear me. He is calling us. He is calling us to reach people who don't know him. Not only in far off Africa where they don't even know the name of Jesus, so many people, 60% of the people we met had never heard of Jesus. How can that be? But you know what the reality is? Half our town doesn't know Jesus. How can that be with all of us sitting here? The time has come to recognize that he is God, he is faithful, and he is calling. The question is, who in this room will obey? Who in this room will live in to the words of Isaiah when the Lord's Spirit said, whom shall we send? And Isaiah stood up and said, here I am, send me. Oh, if that could only be my epitaph and yours as well. Here I am, send me. Church, I am challenging you to get into what's next on God's agenda, not yours. I challenge myself in that same thing because the tyranny of the urgent is so easy to grab onto. But faithfulness to God, that is our mandate. Lord Jesus Christ, we, your church, hold on tight to you. And we ask that you would give us what we stand in need of, not just physically, but the emotional capacity, the spiritual depth to do the things the difficult things that you've called us to, for your glory and your praise only. May the name of Jesus be the only name ever lifted high in our lives. May we hold you up and celebrate you, even if it's a life of costly service, of an exhausting grind. May it be a life knowing that you are God, you are faithful to provide that which you call us into, and that you are calling Speak, Holy Spirit. Your church is listening, and we give this life we live all to you. It's only you. It's only you who our life speaks and praises of. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me as we stand and sing? When, um, when I was young and I played football in high school, my coach used to say to us, um, strap up, it's time to hit. You're like, oh, 
you know. And ever it wasn't like, hey, does everybody want to strap up? We're gonna, you know, and you strap up your helmet, you buckle it up, and you put your mouthpiece in. So you're gonna knock heads, right? This last spring and summer, I have probably said, this is who we are. If you're not gonna do this, this isn't home. Well, you stayed. So it's time to strap up because you don't get to leave. We're locking the doors. You chose to stay. You're one of us now. It's time for all of us to button it up because you're called. Not by me, but by Almighty God. You are called to live faithfully into your redemption and the power of it. So I'm going to invite you to next on Wednesday. And you're like, we're busy. I know, so am I. But I'm going anyway, right? We're busy. We all get it. But here's the thing. What's next for us as a community is finding a way to get every possible seat open for people who don't have one yet. You're called. It's not an option. You stayed. I was fairly rude. You stuck around. This is on you. I'm just accepting your decision. Let's live into this. Let's no longer pretend that the rut we run in is Christianity, but the life we fly in by the Holy Spirit and the redemption of Christ is one that will fill the empty seats wherever with people who come to know Jesus Christ. You are redeemed by Jesus Christ, filled with his spirit, called for his purposes. It's time for you to discern how. We would love to show you what's next at the Foundry on Wednesday. I would love to see you out there. Come out Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., and find out what's next. I heard a family, two families talking at the Zealand East football uh, picnic on Friday, and they didn't, I was going towards a vegetable tray but found the chips. And, um, and I get up there, and I'm standing there, and they're talking. They don't realize I'm there, and they're talking about how they're both starting groups, um, and they're scared. They're a little nervous, but they're excited. They've never done this before. You know, it's just exciting. We're doing it. It's what our church does. And I was like, thank you so much. And Because they go to our church, not a different church. But um, they go to our church. I was like, oh, this is the best. I loved hearing people courageously get involved. It's time. You chose to stay. So now it's time for what's next. God is speaking. You are called. It's yours to discern and answer faithfully. And as you go about that, Before I see you Wednesday, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace as you listen to the calling, as you discern what's next, and as you obey. May the Lord be your peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, my friends, it is time for the church to leave the building. If you want prayer, there are two stations over here. We'd love to pray with you. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.